the first lecture of the course, and thus the final lecture of the course, is the city as cosmos. Um, this lecture has changed a lot uh, in the past few years uh, under the influence of my co-instructor last year, Ali Khodor, and I'm going to incorporate some of the material that he brought to the course um, uh, in brief because we're going to try to do a compressed version of this lecture, which is a huge topic. Uh, and this is where we would typically, I think it's worth noting that the traditional way to teach this course is to start with this slide. Humanity, you know, the, the Homo sapiens came to the to the world, uh, evolved, and are identifiable uh, only 250,000 years ago. That was like a, just a moment ago in geological time. And very quickly uh, took over, um, replacing the Neanderthal um, and emerging in Africa in the Great Rift Valley. Um, and this says 200,000, but I think um, some of these time frames, every year there is new information. And since this was published, which was probably um, not so long ago, we've, we've revised this number from 200,000 years ago to 250,000 years ago. And then the most recent number, it's um, the indigenous peoples of North America. Um, actually, this is correct. Um, we used to say 6,000 years ago, and then we used to say 10,000 years ago, then we were saying 12,000 years ago, uh, but it's really 20,000 years ago where this crossing occurred. And there were, there's new evidence that just came out in the past year to indicate that there were two major uh, migrations, one that occurred 20,000 years ago, and then another one much more recent, uh, 12,000 years ago. And so you have very distinct um, patterns of, um, of settlement in those two waves. But this is a really interesting portrayal of how humans uh, flourished and came to settle every corner of the planet, which connects very directly to the first topic, as in the last topic of the course, which is the Anthropocene. How is it that this one species has come to dominate the reality of the planet so, uh, so completely? And uh, as we debate, when did the Anthropocene really start? Somewhere between the first nuclear uh, weapon testing in the, in the 40s uh, and 50s to the dawn of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and some people might claim it started before that, um, based on this type of uh, analysis. But the big thing uh, we're dealing with in architecture a lot is uh, where, where does human society find meaning? And so this is uh, a really wonderful, uh, comprehensive attempt to represent in a diagram where religious faiths come from, uh, what is the genealogical relationship between uh, what we see today as all of these uh, surviving belief systems um, from the uh, great monotheistic uh, traditions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism to uh, the others uh, that are variously called Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, and the rest. And it's really interesting, the, the key role of this slide at this moment in the lecture is to look down here at the roots. And uh, it's interesting that uh, historical evidence, this is another thing that keeps changing. There's new evidence every year that forces us to reconsider and alter our understanding of the history of these traditions. And some of the more recent uh, evidence suggests common roots uh, in 
uh, the part of the world that in your high school history class would have been called the Fertile Crescent. The lands uh, that are now desert, uh, they've uh, desertified. They've become a desert landscape, but um, thousands of years ago, it was one of the most fertile areas of the planet, one of the most uh, productive areas, most conducive to um, to agriculture, the dawn of agriculture. And so we're gonna look at this area um, and it's, it's not crazy that um, early, the first societies uh, venerated wherever they encountered large forces that seemed to have a significant impact on their world. Those large forces became uh, identified with deities, with supernatural uh, gods. And so the mountains, um, the volcanoes, which scientists now believe uh, is the cauldron out of which the, the chemical transformations produce the first proteins. And from those proteins emerge the first life forms. Uh, animals were also considered to be part of these large forces that became deified. Uh, and so we look at this fertile crescent, you recognize um, this is the uh, Anatolian Peninsula, now that we now call Turkey. Uh, we see the Arabian Peninsula, where Islam emerged, that we've been looking at over the past weeks. Uh, we see Cairo and the River Nile on this corner of Africa. Uh, and so that's just to get us set. Now, uh, the, a lot of the teaching of this topic refers to the Goldilocks condition of humanity, that if not for uh, a bizarre combination of factors and conditions, uh, we would still be monkeys in the trees. Uh, but because of climate, because of uh, evolutionary forces, uh, because of geo geology and geography, uh, uh, by some magical combination of these conditions, magical or God-given, take your pick, um, humanity discovered the potential for these wild grains to uh, produce abundant food. And so they found these, these nuts and grains and things in the wilderness, and they found, uh, humanity found that if you water them or if you shelter them or if you uh, distribute the seeds yourself instead of just letting them propagate through the wind or by animals. All of a sudden we could engage with these wild uh, plants and, and to increase their productivity. We could guarantee uh, a food supply for ourselves in the coming seasons. And the same thing with animals. We found that of the thousands and thousands of animal species that we were hunting uh, for food, some of them did not run away. Some of them could be domesticated. Some of them could be uh, bred with uh, bred with deliberate uh, purpose in mind to create what we now think of as the domesticated animals of agriculture uh, and animal husbandry. And so, uh, and. A big part of it was, as we saw in the reading, is the obsidian uh, quarries of these mountainous regions just north of the Fertile Crescent. And so it's through trade between the areas where there's obsidian with the areas that where this, uh, this early experimentation with plants and animals that uh, allowed uh, for specialization. And the word specialization is, a, is the, one of the key terms and one of the key forces that led to the emergence of the first cities. Uh, if we are all distributed evenly across the landscape, each one of us wakes up in the morning and struggles to find enough food that day to survive. And so that's a lot like the chipmunks I see outside my window. 
So we go from this chipmunk-like daily struggle for enough food to keep us alive. By joining together, we start to develop specialization. Uh, one of you, let's say we're all these, we're all finding ourselves living in a similar place. You know, perhaps Osama is really good at finding these barley berries uh, that are edible. So that becomes his speciality. Uh, and then Tyler's really good at wrestling pigs. And so that becomes his speciality. And uh, Haley turns out she has this supernatural ability to heal people. So that becomes her speciality. And she probably becomes the priestess who uh, dominates us all eventually because she's so power she's so power hungry right and just for example this is how so specialization is both an economic thing that results in the formation of cities of urban societies but it's also a political thing that as soon as you have specialization you start to have power differentiation instead of us all being hunter gatherers we become specialized and we look for ways to differentiate ourselves and our family and our clan uh, from other families and clans and so this is the differentiation that uh, leads to urban society and what's the shape of that well one of the first ones that we like to look at and we in the United States call this Chatal Hoyuk but if you know someone who's ever been to Turkey, they would pronounce it. Say it again. So the C is more like a J. Chatal. So actually, there's not. Chatal means fork. Means what? Fork. And what's hoyuk? Hoyuk. It's it's like people who travel. Oh, night travelers, fork, fork night travelers. Chatal <laughs> Hoyu. I guess we're not that far off. Um, so a long, long time ago, this town formed. Uh, the buildings were right up against each other, and uh, these black lines are not streets. These black lines are the walls. This is a plan cut through. Uh, the settlement, there was only like 7,000 people there, but at that point, that was the biggest city in the world. Um, so Chatal Hoyuk is a really interesting example of how this specialization manifests as urban form, and an urban form that is completely different from what we would think or what we're familiar with. Uh, the houses were basically underground and you walked on the roofs and you entered through the rooftops. So this is what artists uh, and working with archaeologists uh, picture as being what uh, life in Chatal Hoyok uh, was like. And they drew plans. So here's on the wall, they drew a plan of their of their town. So just in case the ruins weren't there, they left us architectural drawings from 7,500 years ago, or from 10,000, basically 10,000 years ago. And that's what it looks like. And they had deities uh, and the house. Every house was a temple to um, the deities. And there was a practice of burying the dead in the house under the floor. And so the house floor over the, the years would get higher and higher and they have to adjust. Hmm? They sleep on top of the dead, yeah. Um, and we know that because we've excavated and found the dead. And every house had uh, uh, a deity, the Marduk, the bull god, who is the, the male deity. But um, the male deity is not as powerful as the female deity, the, the fertility god. 
Um, and because everyone knows, um, if you're paying attention to how the world works, males are optional. You know, you don't need many males around. What you need are women, because that's where all life comes from, right? And so um, it was a, a female fertility goddess dominated society. And when people died, uh, the bodies would be put on these wooden towers uh, for the, uh, the, what are they called? Vultures to uh, pick the bones clean, especially removing the head, and then the rest would be buried under the ground. Um, and so this is, we're moving very quickly through these examples because uh, are, is this going to be important to saving the world? Uh, not the details, not the details of Chatal Huyu, but what's important is that there's this relationship between big forces. Like how do how did we get here? What does life mean? There's a strong direct relationship between these big forces and how we transform the world and how we move through the world. And architecture is a vehicle of that. Architecture in and of itself, who cares? Sorry if anyone's offended. Uh, there it is, I said it. Uh, I don't care. But really, if it's just about the architecture, who cares? Right? A bunch of privileged elite designers that graduate from these fancy pants schools talking to each other in secret code. Uh, I don't have time for that. We've got a world that's at, at crisis. So, um, and I'm ridiculing architecture as a discipline as it was practiced in the late 20th century. When I was in school, my instructors told me with a straight face, you can either do good architecture or you can solve problems, but you have to make a choice. You cannot do both. Insane, right? And I've probably told you the story before, but it's relevant here that if it's just about architecture, just, you know, go ahead. You can build model trains in your basement or you can do architecture, but the world doesn't care either way if it's just about architecture. One of the key uh, messages of this course and of this education that you're getting, this professional education, that even though as recently as my education, um, schools fiercely defended the autonomy of architecture as having nothing to do with the rest of the world, those days are long gone and we flipped it 180 degrees. Your work as an architect only matters to the extent that it has a positive impact on the world. And if it doesn't have a positive impact on the world, you better log into LinkedIn and start networking and figuring out what changes you need to make in your career so that you're doing something with a little more meaning in the context of the challenges that the world is facing. So it's important in your education and in your careers to pay attention to what are the forces that most powerfully drive the formation of cities. And as we always do, we flip that around. Uh, what forces are released by the formation of cities? It's not, cities are not just a passive outcome of these other forces. Uh, they're coming at it, and uh, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just the designer. I do what my client tells me to do, right? No, that's not how it works. Every decision we make as designers has a ripple effect because the, the things that we produce, uh, we sign off on the documents, it uh, gets built, and there it is in the world. And we move on to other projects, but every hour of every day, that project is doing what it's doing for the life of the building. And maybe beyond if it had an impact on the formation of the city itself. So that's why we look at these things the way we're looking at it. And one of the benefits of looking at these things at the end of a long semester of looking at things 
more present in our current world, is we can look back at history not just as, oh, I guess I have to learn history because it's part of the required sequence of courses to get my degree, so here we are, and I guess I gotta do it uh, because it's a hoop that they told me I had to jump through, right? We're not doing that. We didn't do it uh, from the start to the end. We started at the end. We talked about your careers, and we're still talking about your careers. We're still talking about the year, the decade of the 2030s, where you are going to take take over. We hope that you're going to be in charge. You're going to be project architects. You're going to be the boss. You're going to be working directly with big clients and and encouraging them to do the right thing. Or you're going to get frustrated with that whole world, and you're going to run for public office, and you're going to become mayor or minister or governor, and you're going to have actual. You are going to be the client, and that's uh, the training you're getting here. Um, is how to be, how to wield power effectively. So, uh, in that context, let's move quickly through the powers that mattered in the formation of cities and how the formation of cities had a relationship with power. So if you have an insight, if you're like Haley and you're, you have a direct uh, contact with the gods, uh, you, what do you do when you have direct contact with the gods? When you have some insight about the forces of the universe? Well, you tell other people about it and then you manifest it through something that people can experience. You make it experiential. And so we build our cities as a manifestation of these larger forces. And that's what the city as cosmos is all about. Uh, and so we're going to move quickly through how these early cities of uh, the Fertile Crescent developed language to tell other people about it. Although the first things that we do with uh, written language is we keep track of crop yields. And so it's accounting is the first thing. And this is a triangular uh, piece of uh, a stick that we press into wet clay to record uh, this message. And the first writing records we find are inventories. But very soon after that, we see the laws of Hammurabi, uh, which uh, have you heard of the laws of Hammurabi? So we love those laws of Hammurabi because they are ethical practices. They are stories that Im are, have embedded in them ethical codes of conduct for the right uh, administration of large collections of humans in these cities. And so here's the city of Ur, where you need to protect the city because there's no global international order that is making sure that people don't steal and kill each other for personal gain. Uh, so you need to protect, you gather together in the city uh, as a protective measure, and you gather together in the city as an economic measure because you can have specialization and I can trade you my, my barley berries for your uh, bacon. Thank you very much, Tyler, for the bacon. Here's some barley berries, uh, et cetera. But also, to be part of the larger project of establishing the right relationship uh, with the gods. And we all want to have the right relationship with the gods. And so we collect in cities, and that is a big part of it. The city is designed and built as an instrument for producing the right relationship with gods. And we used to do that. Do we still do that now? <clears throat> and so um, the way this course has been taught in the past, we look at Ur, we look at Saddam Hussein's reconstruction of the ruins, we look at the European museums that uh, went to this part of the world, captured the artifacts and relics of history, and brought them back to the museums of Europe as part of a colonial conquest project. Um, and we could go into great detail of all of the religious per functions that this, this is doing. Uh, you go to the mountaintop to get close to God, and then you bring back the word to your people. They make you the leader because you're the conduit between the community and the gods. 
And so that's why Haley would be the dictator telling us all what to do. Um, because she's the one in contact with the gods. And so this area that we've been um, fighting over for the last several decades, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of these places um, were intact for thousands of years. And some of them are now, well, Babylon was, um, to, went to ruin a long time ago, but the remains are still there so we can reconstruct the city and understand some things ab about how it worked. But there's always a sacred precinct, which is the abode of the king, which is the connection to the deities, and a temple complex that would effectively renew the connection with the gods, which would guarantee uh, plentiful harvests and relief from flooding and warfare. And here's the uh, European uh, museum where it was all stolen and taken to uh, to display. And lapis labula, the, the blue in all of this, was a very precious uh, mineral that was uh, difficult to find, but, uh, and so it was very highly treasured. And so there's the whole Mesopotamian uh, urban uh, phenomena of all these three, uh, the three main cities were Ur, Uruk, and Babylon, and, and many others that we'll look at some of them. But also, and typically based on river systems, we have Cairo and Egypt of the Nile River. We have uh, the Yellow River uh, in China that um, is very early urban civilization because of water. Uh, and we have Varanasi on the Ganges River uh, was a very important early site because of Hinduism and that, uh, those traditions. Uh, it was a holy pilgrimage site, and you go to the River Ganges to uh, cleanse and to die. Uh, but also the Indus River Valley, which is the most recent discovery. Uh, a few decades ago, we found uh, the remains of this uh, large city, Mahendra Daro, which was uh, based on the water system uh, and very much uh, designed to control uh, the water flow through the society, and very different from Chatal Huyuk, uh, it had um, um, what we would call a socialist sharing society um, method of self-management. And it shows in the uh, formation of the city itself, in the sharing of resources and uh, doing things for the benefit uh, of the larger society. Um, so we're moving very quickly through these things. Um, Ali did a very interesting, we've seen this map before, Ali did a very interesting uh, quick trip through Beirut because it's a clear example of uh, how uh, a city can be the site of these forces that we've been studying all semester long. Um, Lebanon is what we is where we used to, uh, a place we used to call Phoenicia, and Phoenicia is where written language on paper was invented. Um, so every time you type on a keyboard or write something on paper, you have you're doing something that's very Phoenician in origin, just like our mathematic system uh, is Arabic in origins. And the, the brilliance of the Phoenician innovation is to, instead of doing um, pictures, pictograms, where you draw a picture of the thing you're talking about, uh, eagle, crane, drone, and instead of just drawing a picture and then simplifying and abstracting that picture, uh, you instead sound it out using an alphabet. And so with a very few limited number of of letters, you can uh, actually produce every word in the language. 
I'm gonna skip a lot of stuff. Who knew that there was snow in Lebanon? The cedar forests up in the mountains beyond the flat, the alluvial plain of, uh, of Beirut. Uh, these, this cedar forest is sacred and an important uh, commodity of trade. The Temple of Solomon was built out of the cedar from this, in Jerusalem, was built out of the cedar from this forest. The Phoenician ships that sailed throughout the Mediterranean were built out of the cedar of this forest. This forest is actually a very important uh, part of the Goldilocks conditions that, in, that created the emergence of uh, these, I'm trying to avoid the word civilizations because that's a problematic term, but these powerful societies that end up spreading their influence far and wide. It's kind of like the obsidian mines the obsidian was a crucial component of that Goldilocks condition, and so were these cedar forests. So uh, if we look at, I'm going to get back here. So there's this sacred uh, mythology, um, Poseidon or Neptune, depending on whether it's the Greek mythology or the Roman mythology, or Jan, which I'm not sure what mythology, the Phoenician mythology, that's all the sea god, but the sea god is an important uh, character in the, for, the foundation of Beirut, and so there's this mythological story that is at the core of the first settlements of Beirut, and the temple to Yom is built here, uh, celebrating his... Um, to be polite seduction of the sea nymph, uh, which is the patron saint of the city of Beirut uh, at this location. Um, it was an abduction, if anything. Uh, so a temple to um, the same god that uh, was being venerated, the bull god in, uh, in Chatel Huyuk thousands of years earlier. Uh, so there's a continuity of the bull god in the region leading to that temple, a temple to the cedar, sacred cedar forest, uh, and then the, the god of the sea, and then Antelius is the Phoenician god that equates to Dionysus uh, of the Greek mythology or Bacchus of the Roman mythology. And so you have these very persistent mythologies lasting thousands and thousands of years that are the basis of the religious formation of these cities. And so Beirut is based on this mythology first and foremost. And then later we get the Greek formation and then after that we get the Roman formation because Greece comes through in the Greek Greekophile, the Grecophile, the Greca, they transform it into a Greek city. The Romans come through, they transform it into a Roman city, and we recognize the Cardo Decumanus, the Roman uh, theater, uh, the forum, um, all of the elements of the Roman system that we studied just last week. But it keeps going. Um, the French come in. Let's get to the French. The French come in, and they, they do this houseman thing, right, with the radiating streets from the central rotary, just like the Champs-Élysées and the Lac de Triomphe. And as they go to build this, they say, oh, we can't really plow this right through the yeah. Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was the biggest building in town after the Roman temple uh, was built, and then the church was built and then they run into the Forum. I guess that's the church. Then they run into the ruins of the Roman Forum, so we can't, we can't plow through that. And then next comes Islam in 2006. So we're, we're zooming right through to the present. 2006, Sunni Islam, uh, there are 18 very clear, distinct religious ethnic communities in Beirut, and they're constantly fighting each other. Who's been to Beirut? Anyone? Have you been? Um, do you know anything? 
Am I missing anything that you know that I don't know? Yeah, it's extremely fraught. Uh, these fragile alliances form, and then they shatter, and everybody starts shooting each other. Um, it's it's, uh, and then Israel is very much uh, interested in the rise of uh, the Islamic communities because uh, Iran is very interested in the rise of these Islamic communities. So in 2006, as part of that larger project of the empowerment of one of the 18 communities over the other 17, which is the constant uh, battle in Beirut. And actually, the, uh, Ali, who was my co-instructor last year, is back in Beirut, and he's very seriously considering uh, running for office, so getting involved in this. So crazy that architects go into politics? <laughs> or not so crazy, right? And so the, the mosque is built in 2006 to rival the Catholic uh, Christian community, but they look like they're pretty even here, right? No, they're not even at all. The church is tiny compared to this huge mosque. So you need to, um, you need to, uh, uh, elevate your community over the competing community, who are you going to call? Architects. Right, to build a bigger erection, which is a word I'm using deliberately. And so, what's, so if the, the mosque is taking over your church, who are you going to call? Architects. And what do you do? You build a bigger one. And then you add a three meter tall glowing orange uh, crucifix on the roof. So this architectural competition uh, is being played out uh, between these communities. So these things are, these cosmological forces of world religions are still driving the competition, uh, is one of the big forces driving the competition of the world. It's not over. Just because we in the United States think that the only that all these religious things, you know, nobody's religious anymore, we're all secular, we're all capitalists, all we care about is money, 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 money. Um, <clears throat> just because we think that way doesn't mean the rest of the world is there. It may look like everybody, all anybody cares about everywhere in the world is money, 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 money. But it's very confusing when these people who are supposed to be acting like selfish, self-centered, self-interested, greedy, greedy capitalists, all of a sudden they'll do something that throws you completely off. Uh, and you ask yourself, is it really, <clears throat> is it really just about money? <clears throat> When is money about more than just money? When it's about power. So this ties back to China. We, I guess that was you, the Jennifer's class where we were talking about the profound embarrassment of China in the 19th century when the British, so the British really wanted to pay for for their tea, they wanted to buy tea from China because tea time is really important in England, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants some tea? The English want some tea, right? And so that's that's what England is all about, is tea. Where does tea come from? China. But they don't want to buy anything from us, so we don't have any money to buy their tea. What do we do? Well, uh, back in, 1830s, in the 1830s, the obvious answer was, huh, it's obvious what you do. You grow opium in India, you sail it to China, you get the Chinese population addicted to opium, and you sell them opium. <laughs> Problem solved. And then you use the money from all that opium to buy your tea to bring back to England. That's how we do things. Right? That's how the world works. That's what the United States did in the 80s. Uh, when it was needed money, the CIA needed money and Congress wouldn't give them money to buy the arms for the Contras in Central America, 
So we did what the British did. We sold drugs to get yeah. the money to buy the guns. Famous, most famous story that no one's ever heard. Um, so uh, China has been profoundly humiliated by history, not just the opium wars, but uh, other things as well. And so if you are wondering what China's up to, why are they taking over the world? Well, it's because China was the superpower of the world uh, up through the Mongolian uh, spread across Central Asia and up into Europe. But um, since then, these pesky little uh, European nations, these tiny populations of greedy white people send their sh cute little ships, and but they have cannons and they have gunpowder. By the way, we, the Chinese, invented gunpowder. So how come we're not the superpower? Right? But Europe spread across the planet like a plague and dominated the whole place. Um, what's China up to? China is responding to the forces of history, the large long-term forces of history. They are asserting their birthright as the global superpower. They're not just the largest country uh, in the world in human history. They're also deserving of being the one controlling everything. And so we, the Chinese, have our one belt, one road system, which is our architectural, infrastructural mobilization of our plan to dominate the entire planet. Right? Because you embarrassed us, you the West embarrassed us back in history. Our money, if you think that our money is just about money, <clears throat> That's fine with us. Go ahead, think that. But just to be clear, if anyone's paying attention, our money is just uh, a vehicle to our global domination. It's all about power, prestige, dignity, national identity, and pride in the Chinese uh, identity. So that's what we're doing here, just to be clear. So everyone's favorite thing to analyze is the Forbidden City because it's so clear and the lines of power are so architecturalized. Another one is Islam. The Kaaba is the geometry that, through which the great circles around the planet and if, so the most sophisticated mathematics and geographic understandings in history uh, came to us through Islam because it was important to understand which way to face when it's time when you hear the call to prayer you got to face Mecca which way is that you better know so that's why they uh, developed the most sophisticated mathematics system in the world uh, they were the astronomers that uh, until Galileo um, they dominated the uh, astronomic understanding of the universe, of the heavens. Um, so now we're going to go to the final example <coughs> of the course, which is back to Indonesia. Um, and we see a lot of the things we've been talking about. We see informal settlements. We see industrialization and, and commercial uh, growth uh, that pushes back and eats into the informal settlements. We see big roads. Uh, you can see where the big road is because that's where all the skyscrapers are being built. And then you see this thing, which is this French boulevard strategy that leads to the national monuments, like the Washington Monument. So you see competitive emulation. We are uh, getting our independence uh, from Dutch colonial rule in 1949. And the first president. Uh, is a very powerful guy. He was the leader of the revolution. And when he needs to assert the national identity of Indonesia as a new nation state on the global stage, uh, someone to be a force to be reckoned with, who are you going to call? The architects. The architects. Well, it just so happens I'm President Sukarno. I am an architect. I went to the Bandung Institute of Technology which is one of the, we've seen the Bandung Institute of Technology before in this class, I think, but it's the, 
that came out of MIT, just like Wentworth is built on the model of MIT, so is Bandung Institute of Technology. So he was a modern architect who led the revolution against the Dutch, became the first president, and who are you going to call? He holds a, a global, not a global, but a national competition for multiple structures. The National Mosque, which is just off the picture, the National Monument. And he doesn't really like anybody's entry. And he's the jury of this competition. So he says, listen, I'll take, I'll take this. Uh, he, or he goes to the winner. He says, you know what? I, I love what you're doing. But um, why don't you try this? And why don't you try this? And why don't you try this? So it's really the president's design. That's the mosque in the background. Also the same architect doing both in collaboration with the president of the country. Um, and it's, it's not exactly the same as the Washington Monument. There's something else going on here. By the way, that was the largest mosque in the world when it was built. Uh, the uh, the Episco Episcopal Church is there. So you have a similar thing that we just saw in Beirut. You have this very close competition between the architecture, uh, or you see these uh, competing religious factions through acting through their proxies, which are the architects and the architecture, competing for dominance of the hearts and minds of society. And so you have Christianity here, Islam here. Well, what's going on here? This turns out to be um, when Sukarno, the president, architect, needed to establish Indonesia as an important place, he, he's looking past Christianity, and even though he's a Muslim, he's not really, you know, Islam is great, but he's got to establish himself as the ruler of Indonesia. And Indonesia has a long tradition of kings, and kings have to do certain things. Kings have to maintain the balance between heaven and earth. So he can't be president slash king of Indonesia unless he's maintaining the balance between heaven and earth uh, and doing it through all the ways that kings in Indonesia have always done it. And how do the kings always do it? They establish a point of entry for all the forces of good and evil. So this is the, there's an umbilical cord in the Javanese, the Hindu Javanese belief system. There's an umbilical cord from the heavens to the earth. All good fortune comes from the heaven to the earth through this umbilical cord. And to get it to work, you need to have a place for it to enter. Here it is. And it follows the rules of Hindu symbols. This is the linga and the yoni all in one. Do we know what linga and yoni mean? So just like the fertility goddess uh, was obviously the important deity in Chattaluya, uh, the in Hinduism, the linga is the male genitalia, and the yoni is the female genitalia. Because without those, the combination of those two things, there is no creation, there is no life. And it's just obvious that those are the two most important factors in all of creation that created the world itself. And so we unabashedly, even though it's the largest Muslim country in the world, and, and in Islam, we don't really like genitalia. We don't even like hair. right? So it's, it's really kind of, from that point of view, it's kind of an awkward thing. But there's no choice. If you're going to be president of Indonesia, you got to have the linga and the yoni. It's, it's abstracted. It's architecturalized. No one's offended, I hope. You know, so there, but, but it has to do what it has to do. And so that, and then he redraws the map, just in case anyone missed the message. He redraws the map of the world, and he takes the zero uh, meridian that passes through Greenwich, England, and he relocates it so that it passes through this monument. So this is the zero meridian in the Indonesian map right after independence. And he renames the Indian Ocean the Indonesian Ocean. So, uh, how many of you have heard of the word Indonesia before this class? 
So you've heard the word. Did you know that it was a big country? Because um, it's uh, it's kind of it kind of didn't work. Not only is it not the center of the world, uh, even though it's the fourth largest country and it's obviously the center of the world. Look at that thing. Um, but most people have never heard of it in the United States, at least. And that has something to do with um, the Vietnam War, but we won't get into that. So, um, so I was really interested in, when I was an architecture student, I was really interested in Salk Institute and how, I was really interested in the buildings that uh, Louis Kahn uh, designed and then I got really into the Virendale Trust and the arrangement of the laboratories, you know, the, the Salk Institute. And, uh, but then as I was doing my month-long analysis drawings of the Salk Institute, it caught my attention that the, really the most powerful thing about the Salk Institute is not the building or the two buildings, it's the space between the two buildings. And that launched me on a trip to learn Italian, to get a grant, to go to... Rome when I graduated to study the Noli map and how the spaces of Italy operate uh, where the architecture is forming the spaces and we talked about this on Wednesday but something weird happened on my way to Rome I got distracted by this photograph and looking at this photograph and hearing the stories of a friend of mine who had just been here <coughs> um, this gateway building with a garden on the inside. I'm like, wow. And so I learned Indonesian. And at the, the next uh, economic downturn that hit, I applied for a grant. And I got a three-month grant to go study the architecture of the city based on this photo. And so I went to the library. And I looked for everything I could find on Javanese architecture. And you know what I found? one book in the New York City Public Library. One book, and it was about these ancient Hindu temples that had nothing about anything. So I arrived uh, on my three-month grant, and I went to this gate. I found the gate, I went in, and they actually allow people to, it's like a homestay. For three dollars, you can spend the night. Um, there was no Airbnb at that time. And so, I stayed there for a few days, and uh, one day I came out and I said, uh, I started talking to the guard because I spoke some Indonesian. Uh, I said, what's going on here? He said, oh yeah, this is a house. It's a prince's house, or it's a, it's a noble person's house, and it's basically a miniature replica of the palace. And I said, palace? There's a palace? And he said, oh, yeah, you just go down the street and uh, turn right and take another right and ask again. And there's a palace. And so I did exactly that. I walked through the neighborhood, went around, and I went to the front gate. Sure enough, there's a palace. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and there's a guard. So I asked the guard, I said, is this the palace? He said, yeah, it's the palace. And while I'm talking to him, asking him about the palace, uh, these people walk past. And the guard all of a sudden is is like bowing and doing this and, and doing all this stuff. And I said, who is that? He said, oh, that was the prince. I said, there's a prince? He said, oh, yeah, there's 36 princes and princesses. 36? And he said, yeah, the king has, king, there's, he said, the king has six wives. King, there's a king? You know, so I'm like blowing my mind. It's like I thought kings and palaces were fairy tales, right? Who has kings and palaces anymore? Yeah? Thailand, right. I didn't know that at the time. I was just an architecture student from the United States. Paid, you know, rewarded for not paying attention to the rest of the world, because that's the way architectural education used to be. So I find out, so uh, I become very close friends with the prince in charge of managing the palace. And he tells me, that yeah, there's this thing about power, the heavens, the umbilical cord, the, you know, the structure of the universe in the Hindu cosmological model. And oh, by the way, the palace is a model of the structure of the universe. And the palace is kind of this broken down, worn down building. 
but uh, the, the, or a series of buildings, but it is this cosmological model of the Hindu Javanese universe that is built on the palace. And you guys have Google Earth, so this means nothing. You know, it's trivial to you. You could do this and you just take a screenshot and you're done. But at the time, uh, satellite photography was extremely expensive, and the nature of national security is that it was illegal to have an, an aerial photograph of anything. Imagine that. So it was illegal to have an, an aerial photograph of anything. Um, but I was walking through the local university and uh, just you know walking past some architecture faculty offices, and I glance over, and it's like, and I take a step back, and I I look in, and I go in, and there's a photograph on the wall, not this one. There's a photograph on the wall, and I'm looking at it, and there's someone sitting there, and I said, is that the palace? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's the palace. How did you know? Oh my God, where did you get this photo? And uh, basically, she became one of my best friends uh, in Indonesia. And that photograph became the reason why I took my three month grant and I stayed for four years. And I became the royal architect for the King of Java. Uh, and I drew the palace uh, with a team of architecture students, paid for out of my three month grant. And then I show up here, and in this class, one of the students just did a quick little, you know, it was a weekly assignment, did this analysis, where we see the ceremonial axis through the palace complex. We see the umbilical cord passes through from heaven to earth right here. This is where all the good, before the, before the architect president tried to move the umbilical cord to the capital, this is where it was. All good fortune flowed from heaven and earth through the center of the palace. And this is the most sacred place. And then as you move out, it's less and less sacred. And it manifests in how you speak. There's a different vocabulary. You speak high Javanese when you're close to the center, and you speak middle Javanese when you're further away. And you can speak low Javanese when you're out of the palace. And, and the people who live on the north and south shores of Java, they don't even know how to speak high Javanese because they don't need to, they're not at the center. But people in the center, not only do you need to speak high Javanese if you're here, when you're talking to the king, he gets an, an extra high Javanese. There's another vocabulary. You can't say, have you eaten, and use the word in high Javanese. You have to use, have you kingly eaten? Have you, have you, you know, there's a fancy pants word. You can only use that word when you're speaking to the king. There's a whole vocabulary that doesn't exist outside of the presence, physical presence of the king. And it has to do with how you dress. You, in the old days, you could not wear shoes. So Dutch people, the Dutch colonial authorities, had to take off their shoes. Uh, it's the cultural layerings um, are very thick. So the architecture is an armature on which all of these other cultural attributes hang. And their ceremonies uh, reinforce it. Um, this is the Javanese New Year with white buffalo. And uh, then here's the veneration of the Queen of the South Seas. Uh, there was a fire. They had to rebuild it. And so they, there's the king pounding the golden nail into the sacred tree that was harvested uh, according to the certain rules. Here's the washing of the sacred cannon that no one is allowed to see except for the king and this priest. And when the water comes off, you wash the cannon, you wash the structure that houses the cannon, and then you wash the pavilion that shelters the structure that houses the cannon. So the cannon is in there, this is the sacred structure, and then this is the pavilion. And um, as the water comes off, you know, it's dirty. We wash it three times a year, but there's a lot of dirt. People are thronging, give me some of that water. Ring your rag out into the funnel so I get some of that sacred, dirty water. And when my child is sick, I rub some of that water on her forehead to help her be cured. I sprinkle it in the rice fields to ensure a good harvest. 
It's very valuable stuff. People still follow these traditions. And this is the important concept of syncretism. That uh, the Queen of the South Seas is the big deity in Java until Hinduism, Hindu Buddhism comes across through trade with India. And so we get a wave of Hindu Buddhism 2,000 years ago, and they, they syncretize. So Hindu Buddhism doesn't replace the Queen of the South Seas. The Queen of the South Seas becomes a character in the Hindu Buddhist story and in the cosmological structure of the universe. And so you have the Queen of the South Seas, you have Hindu Buddhism, then you have what's next, what comes next in the 13th century. You have Islam. Islam sweeps through. And if you want to stay a Hindu Buddhist, you either go to Mount Meru in these three villages, or you go to Bali. Right? So Bali is where you go if you want to stay Hindu Buddhist. Um, but everyone else, it's Islam. But is it all Islam all the time? No. Islam has been syncretically hybridized. It's been, uh, it's been brought into the religious system. Uh, and then next, who's next? The Dutch show up. And they show up with the Queen Wilhelmina in the 19th century gives the king a present you know, from one from one royal to another, from one royal family to another royal family. Here, take this Baroque carriage. The Baroque carriage, every Wednesday night, gets a sacred offering, and the carriage is renamed with a Javanese uh, religious name, and it becomes a sacred, over the years, it becomes more and more sacred. It's a central object of the Hindu, Buddhist, Javanese cosmological system. And so all of these things are layered one on top the other. And you get Baroque architecture, the Ottoman fez, the Dutch brass band, the, the European tails coat, but they snip off the tails so that the sword that they have to wear, a little short dagger that has a ceremonial uh, religious meaning, and you tuck it into the back of your sarong, which is a Javanese skirt, but if your sword is there, the tails stick up. So they snipped off the tails. And this is the required religious uh, royal outfit uh, that is at the core of Javanese culture. Even though it very clearly comes from other foreign sources, they embrace it and make it Javanese. And here's another bizarre thing that uh, you have the linga and the yoni of Hinduism being constructed into these offerings uh, with the Indonesian flag uh, being used to celebrate the Islamic holiday of Grebeg Maulud, uh, which is very strange if you're Muslim. Right? Isn't that strange? What's, what's the holiday? Uh, Maulud. It's uh, the three. One is the uh, ascension of the prophet. One is, help me out, the birth of the prophet? The, the land of the holy book. Well, he was given the holy book. So is that Maldu? I'm not sure. Um, there's Idul Fitri. Anyway. And there is one. Right, and he writes this uh, horse, which is fly, and takes him to speak with God. Right, and he goes there from the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's one of the three big Muslim holidays, and this is how it's celebrated. Out of the sacred kitchen, they produce this food offering. It's paraded through uh, the palace. Uh, up the ceremonial axis, out through the front uh, square where there's a big uh, festival going on. So it comes from the sacred kitchen over here, through here, it's paraded. That photo was taken right there. Um, it's paraded through here where there's a big 
annual fair going on, and then to the Grand Mosque, the Royal Mosque, which is the big mosque of the region. And it sits there um, to, so the essence of the offering is gathered at the mosque. And once all the sacred essence has been gathered out, it's brought back out of the mosque where people rip it to shreds. Again, because every element of this has sacred power in the Hindu Javanese tradition. And so back to that gate, here's that gate, the royal house of the local uh, nobleman uh, is surrounded by the people that the nobleman has to take care of. So he starts a factory uh, making whatever, furniture, rice wine, whatever, There's a, or batik, fabrics, beautiful stuff. Um, and these, he gives these people uh, an economic uh, activity to support economically this community. And if there's an attack from an outside force, these become the defenders of the royal household. Uh, and this is the commercial street, so you have the development of shops along the street. So they have their own independent income stream, but then the, the community is supported economically and socially. It's the symbiotic relationship uh, between noble power and the people and the community. And so this is the physical armature around which the, the social formation operates. And um, so everything that happens in the palace has to happen on the right day with the right offerings. Uh, if you come into the palace, you have to wear this ribbon, which is signifying to the Queen of the South Seas that you're a friend of the king's. And every year, the king renews that connection with the Queen of the South Seas uh, on the, the anniversary of the coronation. And it's done in this tower that, at the end of my time there as royal architect, uh, we had the opportunity to rebuild or repair the tower this is Ta Asmo, my friend who uh, taught me about Javanese carpentry, but he's also a priest. He's, um, he's the carpenter priest, right? Uh, he's an architect, builder, priest. And every detail of the column has a functional you know, detail meaning, like when you draw details in your comprehensive studio, it's got a functional purpose. And you, and we're going to do redlining on Friday or later today, right? You have a review? And so we're going to be redlining and saying, no, no, it works like this. Well, if Pa Asma were here, he'd say, listen, yeah, functionally uh, it's got this, but also the water that, that is coming down the rain screen portion of your wall section, that's the sacred elixir of life. And you have to respect it, not just keep it out of your building, but it's sacred. So you have to respect it and you have to do this, this. So it's more than just the technical. Everything is simultaneously technical and spiritual uh, in every detail. And here he is. Uh, we just are going to be measuring this. And we have to do prayers and wear the sash and do the offerings. Um, that's you. <laughs> no, no, that's. Uh, no, no, far right. No, 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 no. Far right. More. <laughs> Does that look like me? Yeah. yeah. It does? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> I was young at one point. So, and then we, uh, we were invited by the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Have you heard of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture? I've mentioned it. So the Aga Khan Award for Architecture had its award ceremony every three years and uh, we invited them to have it at the palace, and they had it at the palace. And so there's His Highness, His Highness the Aga Khan, His Royal Highness the King of Java, and that's me. I'm the translator. That um, very shortly before this, I was trying to fix the toilet, and it got sprayed with water. And then they said, No, no, we need you to be translator. So I finished 
because there was a long line at the, ba at the women's bathroom. So I found that the toilet was broken and no one was going to fix it. So I fixed the toilet with my Swiss Army knife. And then I, even though I was soaking wet, I put on my jacket and I went and I translated for these two guys. So is there anything else? So I guess, um, so the, the key thing here is these big, powerful, religious, spiritual forces are not just from Chat El Hoyo, you know, 7,500 years ago. They were driving the formation of cities and the forces of history throughout the ages up to and including the present. Uh, and including these things are still happening today. There is this this king died in 2004. His insane uh, son is is locked himself in the palace so he could be king. So he's king, and these these ceremonies are still operating. The palace is still going strong. The princes and princesses are still competing for power, and they're using these forces and they're using the architecture as uh, a vehicle for fighting those battles. Islam, Christianity, there's still competition, nationalism, all of these things, it's not just about money. Despite all, everything we said about Dubai and financialization, uh, and, and the proof of that is the biggest force that you're gonna deal with during your careers uh, on the international stage uh, all of these forces, what's happening in Africa, that's what's going to determine whether we hit peak human at 8 billion or 12 billion or somewhere in between. And what's the biggest force in Africa? China. China is the biggest player in town, and they're in it to win it. And they have to win it to overcome these centuries of humiliation at the hands of these capitalist European corporate uh, national entities. Uh, and that's the job of the 104 billion Chinese uh, entrepreneurs who are operating uh, on the world stage. Uh, and if you think that uh, these forces are not impacting you already, look at your rent uh, check the next month and know that a certain percentage of that rent is because of the financialization forces of Chinese entrepreneurs. Yes, it is about the money. They want to launder the money. They want to protect their money by investing in American real estate. A significant percentage of your rent check every month is there because of the inflation imposed by these uh, absentee landlord investors. Uh, uh, but they're protecting their money so that they're that they're playing the long game of global domination and restoration of China to a place of greatness. Um, and I'm not sure which is worse, the pure greed corporation forces that are destroying the planet or the larger uh, mobilization of national pride. Um, but between the two of them, there's, that's, those, are, those are the competing forces for the rest of us who are trying to uh, guide uh, the development of society and our systems towards a survival strategy in places like Venezuela. Okay? Get it? Everybody's good? So that's, that's the class. <laughs>